Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. And on today's show, we have a very special guest, Aaron Norris. And Aaron, I've known for years from the private lending world to property radar. Um, I know I've listened to his father. I can't tell you that I think his father uh, provides the most uh, relevant economic outlook for the residential um, housing market that you can imagine. I'll just give you a little tip. In 2005, I was telling Aaron uh, before we went live. In 2005, I remember uh, Mr. Norris saying, hey, it's probably a good idea to sell your California real estate. Um, and of course, I was young and dumb and didn't listen. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, 2007 rolled around and my mortgage business froze and all my houses were upside down by 60% in Nevada that I owned all these rentals. Uh, it was a very difficult time. And I just think, you know, you got to listen to people that study the data uh, and, and we're going on and we're going to be talking about property radar. We're going to be talking about opportunities uh, where maybe investors can be looking right now for not only finding deals, but the other uh, benefits of like opportunity zones, uh, legislation, things that are going on. Uh, Aaron is like, uh, understands data. He understands, um, you know, what to look for and trends in the market. So it's going to be a very interesting conversation. Aaron started his career, uh, real estate career at five years old, fixing houses in his father's flip business in California. Mm. After living in New York city for almost a decade, he joined the family hard money business as a mortgage officer and researcher producing numerous market timing reports and award-winning resources for the real estate community. As a VP of Market Insights for Property Radar, he, he speaks and writes nationally on trends and, and the power of public records that help Main Street compete with Wall Street. You'll find his work on Forbes.com, Think Realty, Bigger Pockets. He also has been in, directly involved in raising over $2 million for charity since 2008. Welcome to the show, Aaron. You have an impressive background. I can't wait to dive in and talk real estate with you. Glad to be here. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So let's kind of circle back. And, and um, we, we had spoken with Sean and we, we got kind of a high level of property radar. Um, let's talk about some some interesting ways to, to um, use the data on property radar for certain niches where, where you see some investors moving towards that might be a uh, might put some thought into people's heads about marketing and, and finding mm -hmm. deals and, and opportunities, maybe just not traditional opportunities, but in opportunity zones for the tax benefits and so forth. So uh, what, what are some nuggets you got for us today? Yeah, I know you, uh, you, I don't know if you currently belong with the California Mortgage Association. Um, are, are you still a member? You know what? I've kind of, I got married. I fell off the cliff for like three <laughs> years. So I, I understand need to get back involved, but yes. Great I'm group. actually I'm actually teaching um in in March they have a conference I'm on a, a panel teaching about SB9 SB10 and ADU so there's a lot of opportunity at the local level that a lot of real estate investors aren't paying attention to sometimes because they're out of the area and opportunities can live in the city level if if you're paying attention it's just you don't know where to look so ADUs were that way and then came out in California and I know you have listeners outside of California but I would recommend people really start paying attention to some of the things that um, Minneapolis is doing, um, California getting rid of single family zoning. So a lot of opportunity for multifamily is going to originate moving forward in the residential space if you know where to find it in the data. So we'll talk about that today. It's pretty fun and nerdy. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I have a lot of clients that, um, and actually the financing is kind of challenging for these mm -hmm. ADUs. So I have a couple of niche lenders that that will look at it, you know, because it, it's challenging because they can maybe get a line of credit from. Uh, but um, but more and more, I think private lenders are getting into the space where they because you also have the stick built right ADUs, then you have the modular builds, which are hard because you need to put some of the money up front and it makes it difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have one investor in, in, in California. Um, and he's got like 15 ADU projects. He's like buying in Santa Cruz and he's buying multifamily where he can add. He bought like an eight unit building and, and multifamily building. And he's putting four of these prefab ADU units on it. And he's going to crush it. He's absolutely going to crush it. He's like learned the laws. He's he's found these these modular uh, dealers that understand how to like, you know, get them approved, fast track that. 
So it's interesting mm -hmm. how we might be able to look at the data to uh, identify opportunities. And I was just watching a bigger pocket show on a guy, he takes single family homes, he just carves them and puts, makes them into duplexes. So I think there's lots of trends that we can make because everybody's like, well, you can't make money in California on rental property, but maybe you can. So maybe, maybe you can. Well, yeah. let's let's cover what ADUs really quick, just in case anybody doesn't know what it is. ADUs are secondary homes. They're just in, in by code. It's still a, a residential R1 lot, um, but you have the secondary space where whether it be a converted garage, a detached um, single like a single unit up to 1,200 square feet. Um, the state regulated it because of affordable housing becoming an issue. Um, Gavin Newsom came on board promising a ton of houses. Um, we took a decade off of building and uh, we knew that it was going to be a problem. What's interesting about ADU and why it's so powerful, the, the National Association of Home Builder just came out with some data showing that, you know, on average of the 400 square foot built house nationwide, $100,000 of that is spent on government regulation, impact fees, things like that. So when you're talking about a state in California where a lot, let's be really generous and say a lot is $200,000, we know that's really low, especially for like Bay Area, Bay Area. But if you're looking at a lot that costs 200 grand and you've got $100,000 in impact fees and no sticks and bricks, just getting started, you're out the door 300,000. It's ridiculous. So affordable housing is a real challenge. And because of COVID, you know, we have a lot of people moving into rural areas. So rural communities are having this conversation, like how do we create more? Um, we have a shortage of um, skilled labor. Uh, <laughs> COVID has made, I'm, I do construction. It is extremely difficult and very risky right now. Just going to put that out front, expect a lot more expenses than you're expecting and expect it to take double the amount of time. It's just really crazy. It takes 10 months just to get appliances these days. So it, it's challenging, but there's some really unique opportunity happening in California. So ADU laws started in 2017 and the state just kept hammering. By 2019, they're like cities, enough. No, by right, whether you're an investor or you're a homeowner, you have the right to build at least one of these on your property, if not two, if you're living in it. So some people don't know that you can triplex size where you can have a detached ADU up to 1200 square feet, depending on you know local code and whatnot, and you can convert your garage. So you can have two rental units on a property. That's a huge deal if you're a retiring senior, um, if you're a parent that uh, wants to have other family members live on a lot, there's just so many different uses for it these days. So really cool opportunity. In the data, which are an easy way to look for it is, let's say uh, I need a 7,500 square foot lot. So you're looking for lots 7,500 square foot and larger where the, a single family home is 2,500 square feet or lower. So I created a term called Cramlord. Don't be one. <laughs> Don't ruin the value of your property because you're crappy at design and you're ruining the value of the property by just poorly designing something. There's, there's no excuse. So do it right. But, uh, you know, in the data, you can look at the size of the lot and figure it out. You can virtually drive for ADUs, uh, look at maps, look at the housing placement. Um, so anyway, just search us with the data on the property, um, just trying to figure out some lots that would most benefit and be easier to build something on it would be good. What does it look like? Do you, have, you, have you looked into like what that's going to mean for California over like the next 10 years? Like how many ADUs are they expect to be to be built on properties? Um, it's, it's funny you ask that. I actually emailed a few senators that are behind SB9 um, and I asked them specifically, um, California is starting to collect that data and why they're doing it is it counts towards RENA number or regional uh, housing numbers, RHNA, it stands for something, but um, Within the next eight years, cities are mandated to build so many affordable housing. So I think in Orange County, as an example, they have to build something like 147,000 affordable units. And there's a, a matrix of super affordable and all this stuff. Um, but ADUs are going to count towards that amount, which is really great for cities because there's no way that they're going to be able to meet those goals without working with investors um, doing this. So investors who have, you know, the Norris Group helped people get into properties in 09 when they were, you know, they could buy something in Lancaster or Riverside, San Bernardino for 30 to 50 grand, like a 3-2. It's crazy. In many instances, those have 10 x since then. Want to make more money? Build an ADU. An ADU can cost anywhere between eighty thousand to, you know, two hundred and fifty, depending on the level of spec you're building. And it doesn't have to be stick built in or modular. It can be a manufactured home. 
So in some cases, cities are getting so creative, they don't care if it's a tiny home. And tiny homes actually are not considered real property as personal property that falls under DMV regulations. So you really have to pay attention to the states at the bar, but it doesn't mean your local jurisdiction can't be more flexible, but you need to pay attention. So it's there's some really interesting opportunity, especially if you start uh, opportunity stacking with things like opportunity zones. And I'll give you a perfect example of how I do that with the data. So in downtown Riverside, I was shocked to find out that the entirety of downtown is an opportunity zone. And you're like, Aaron, opportunity zones are so old. Like, why are you talking about them? Well, if you own crypto and you're looking to diversify out or you own stocks, it is the only method that I know to move ca capital gains from an asset like that into real estate. And I, I, you might get this call all the time too. Like, oh, can I move from real estate into trustees or trustees capital gains into real estate? I'm like, nope, sorry, not like kind, can't do it. But opportunity zones, you can. So downtown Riverside, all an opportunity zone. You look for lots that are zones like an R3 or an R4 or so, so for triplexes or fourplexes. And then you do a search. I only want to find properties that have a single family house on it. There are hundreds of opportunities. I was shocked. So it's already been upzoned and people just aren't taking advantage of the highest and best use of the property. So according to California law, I can take if something zoned R3 or a triplex and it's got a single family home on it. I could technically build five more units on that property. And guess what? For the sake of financing, it counts as one to four. Pretty cool. Yeah, that, no, that is amazing. I think that's like the the way that investors, like there's certain investors that's that their model right now, they they see these opportunities and and um I think they're like you're saying, they're they're everywhere, these opportunities. Um, but you just gotta kind of learn these rules and laws and legislation uh, to make you a better investor. But you know, it's some investors are, that live in California, for example, are like they're investing out of state. They're going to like places like Indiana, and mm -hmm. because the I am, but, I'm I'm doing Florida. I get it. Some people don't want all their stuff in California because yeah. the affordable housing conversation is forcing them to do things really strange that are not landlord friendly. It makes it very difficult to be a landlord. I talk to investors every day who are like, I'm selling everything. I'm done with California. Everything has gone up so much after the downturn. I'm going to 1031 exchange and into states that are more landlord friendly. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I like the idea. I mean, even if you're getting started and you need to house hack and you're creating a, you know, you could buy a property owner occupied, you could convert the garage potentially to a junior ADU and, and then mm -hmm. get a, a, a modular manufactured property in the back. And now all of a sudden um, you were spending $3,500 a month on your mortgage. Now you, now you're positive two grand a month. So uh, I, I'm getting more into like everything I look at is like, how can we live for free? How can we cash flow? Yeah. I mean, oh my gosh. I, yeah. Do you, do you take uh, conversations from millennials? I got it. If I talk to one more millennial that are like, <laughs> they, they want to talk about investment properties before they own anything. I'm all, we have lifetime low interest rates. Is there any way I can at least get you into multifamily? Like, please. Yeah. <laughs> so Yeah. I, I mean, I, I was talking to a lady and she wanted to buy an investment property. I go, where do you live? She goes, San Jose, California. How much are you spending in rent? $3,500 a month. Oh. Do you own a property? Do you, do you like, why don't you just go buy a duplex or triplex? And like, it's such a basic, like foundational, like, I'm glad, I'm glad people are talking about house hacking. Cause I even look at like what I did to buy my first house. And I made tons of mistakes over the last 20 years, but, but like, if you just take these baby steps, it's mm -hmm. so much easier than stressing yourself out and like, Maybe your first investment shouldn't be in Indiana and you're in California because, you know, finding the right management, maybe it should be a house hack type mm -hmm. of scenario. It's probably the, the easiest way you can get the highest leverage and people just aren't talking. I interviewed um, a guy named Robert Leonard. He's a millennial and he's super sharp and he like, he, I like what he did. He, he studied 7,000 markets throughout the United States and he he, he stumbled on this one market in Texas and he just buys houses there. He has like the, it, it met all his benchmarks. He said like job growth, this and that, this and that super analytical guy. And then, um, and then it's like, he's financially free. It doesn't mean he's making a killing every month, but he doesn't, he doesn't need a day job. Right. Which is like hmm. the goal of many people here. And then, and then he got me interested. He's doing RV. He buys RVs and he's, He's um, running them out on those sites because they're kind of like the Airbnb type of Toros, whatever. I mean, there's ways to make money. That's what excites me the most now, I think, is like because I didn't do a good job. And now I'm 44 and I'm like, OK, like we got to I got to like get more cash flow. Yeah. Right. And I'm yeah. like, 
Now you can buy an RV, you can finance 100% on a 20 year term and run your numbers. And, and you know, this guy's netting four or five grand a, a month right now with his RV. Now, will this always be the same because we have COVID and all these yeah. other things? But if you can make two grand a month on, on something, that's pretty good. And how many doors in Indiana do I have to buy, right? If I'm getting $300 a door, I have to buy so many. So I think having an open mind and like, it's cool that we're having this conversation about ADUs and like SB9, uh, cause I don't really, I, I know a little bit about ADUs from the financing side and, but it, it, it's, it's valuable depending on where you're at is to know these options so you can maximize properties. Like I have one guy in Northern California that I know all he does is take single family and converts to uh, duplexes. Now, I don't know mm -hmm. if he does them all legally or not, but he's crushing it. <laughs> he's crushing it on the cash flow. So um, I mean, I suggest doing it by permits and so forth, everybody. But but anyway, knowing these loopholes mm -hmm. uh, um, to maximize and then, you know, there's loopholes for the tax breaks, like there's cost segregation and there's all these things we can do. And that's really why I enjoy the podcast, bring on like different uh, speakers, because they, everybody has a little bit different insight, right? Like you've done so much research on the housing market, you know where to find the data, like you know, because earlier I said, you know, what's the outlook? You know, what did, what's your father saying on the outlook? Are we going to have another crash? Because if you listen to these YouTubers in the media, oh, God. like it's like one day it's like we have a shortage of housing. The next day we're all screwed. We're going to all go and, and burn. Right. Like it's it's terrible. Um, and yeah, and it, I get that. Sorry. I get that, that asked a lot of property radar because Sean is very known because he started as foreclosure radar. He completely changed the game when it came to data around foreclosures. The problem is that we just have a very different market and, it, and it's weird. I'm so tired of seeing those clickbaity videos. And believe me, I, I wrote for Forbes. I write for magazines. They want you to write clickbaity, you know, articles. So people click on it. I get it. But at the same time, you don't, you have to do more than breathe to get a million dollar loan. Builders are not overbuilding to where if they were, was a little bit of a price shop, they're immediately burying people that have nothing down. Um, interest rates are at a lifetime low. I think people forget interest rates at the time were 68% depending on where you were and market and whatnot. It, it's just so different. And because of COVID remote work, every time a wave of COVID happens, you know, it, it, people want space. I think this is going to be the first year in a long time when the data comes out that we're going to see new builders building things with more space with that in mind. I think people, Houses are way more than just where you live now. It's where you educate, work, play, live. It's it's a lot more. So people are demanding more space. Um, so I just, I I don't think it's going to be as exciting as last year, but I don't see a big crash coming. I think it's just going to be sort of boring. Um, and there's, in some markets, there's still a lot of affordability. I think markets like along the coast could have a very different experience than in those inland. And it's going to be very interesting to watch how cities respond you know i've been part of housing coalitions at city government and stuff and there's a real problem they they need they want housing it's just really hard to create right now and it i've watched what my rentals have done in the last year in california and florida and to be honest with you i'm just really uncomfortable um having such a swing in in rents um i have this one example where i'm one of those guys i want people to stay put i don't raise rents consistently in California, I had somebody there five years ago, the rent was 1450, they left and it just jumped to 2395. And this rental is not in a fantastic area in the Inland Empire. I'm like, uh, <laughs> this is not normal. And I can already tell what politicians are gonna do. You know, here in California, they're gonna do really crazy things that aren't landlord friendly, trying to lock you in. Oh, that's why I moved half my stuff to Florida. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good, you gotta, like, I think it's a good time to take some chips off the table, especially if you're all on one market, like what you did, but you could be 1031 exchanging and diversifying where you own property. I mean, right now, like I looked at like what, what where I want to invest. I used to flip a lot and I just don't like flipping. All right? It's too much of a job. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go. I like to buy cheap properties, uh, affordable housing with high priced rent, ratios, not really counting for big appreciation markets, but like areas where most people aren't looking for um, to buy real estate because they're not on the main mainstream like Indianapolis or these hot markets, which I'm kind of bucking the, the, the trends of my thought process. But my thought process is to buy duplexes and fourplexes uh, where people eventually are get, the first time homebuyer can come buy this down the road from me and they can live for free because I think 
eventually that's pretty much the only way a lot of people are ever going to mm -hmm. be able to afford to, to buy a home and to create wealth is to do strategic house hacking and things like that. So my thesis is to do this and, and I could be wrong. I could say like, okay, you're buying in a, in a population with only 6,000 people. That's stupid. Like what happens if, you know, so a lot of people would, would, would argue with my kind of concept, but at the same point, where can you buy a duplex for 106,000 that spits off $1,700 a month in, in gross rents? Good for you. If the numbers yeah. work, I, I have a lot of investors looking at tertiary markets, if, if nothing else, because some of the secondary markets are getting really crowded. You've got I buyers that are taking the easy ones and, and driving up prices to where they really don't make sense. If the numbers don't make sense, you're speculating, you're not investing. So you really do have to be careful in making sure you're getting into something where the numbers work. So I, I love your, your idea. <laughs> so if numbers work, who cares what people think? And it has you, has the buying trends. Like um, last time I heard your dad speak, he was building in Florida and he got in way before the boom. And so he's, probably, he's, yeah. he's been in Florida since hurricane Andrew. So yeah. he's been there for his best friends there. My brother lived there for a long time. Yeah. We're building quite a bit in, in Florida and the numbers are just so different. I mean, we're buying lots for, you know, 30 or 40 grand where, you know, that changes the numbers of building dramatically. Um, so it's just possible. And they're very landlord friendly. The idea was selling the things that we bought in 09 to 2014 um, that have 4X to 10X. I'll give you an example. I had a condo that I bought back in, I think it was 2012. I bought it, I think 70 or 80 grand. It sold for 240 and it was unwarrantable. I wanted to get rid of it while there was one investor who owed way too many units in this particular complex. The rent wasn't that good and the HOA was just being mismanaged and it was close to $400 for a 600 square foot condo. I'm like, I gotta get out of this. But I turned that 240 grand into a four bedroom, two bath that just, it just came out um, in December and it rented for 23.95 with no HOA. Brand new, different, different kind of clientele for renters. <laughs> it's just... I, I love new houses. This is just what, what I'm comfortable with. I am definitely a landlord. I'm like you. I thought starting this business, I had to be a flipper like my dad. And it was a lot of pressure and I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy the process because it was a job, but I love house collecting and I love new houses. So, yeah. you know, I think that's the biggest mistake people make is that they think they have to re replicate somebody else's success. Please bring you to the business. You are going to hate this business if you do not recognize who you are and who you want to be in the business. You do you. If I talk to a... a uh, an introverted engineer about door knocking using property radar, they're going to cry. They're going to hate their life. They're never going to show up and they're never going to execute. If I talk to that same engineer about lot splits and things that are a lot more process oriented, they're going to love their life. So, you know, just do you. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, I just started like uh, picking up the phone and calling listing agents, like in these markets in, in, uh, Midwest and Pennsylvania and different places that I was interested in buying. And I started having conversations, TTP, talk to people. Right. And, you know, like I just, I just got a fourplex under contract um, for $94,000 and it's in decent, decent shape. And uh, the two rent, two units are rented below market, but I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave the one in because it's an older per couple and I'm going to move their rent slightly because they're just way under market. It's just, it, it has to make sense from an investor standpoint, but well, yeah, <laughs> I don't need to go and like try to squeeze every dollar out of it. That, you know, it's still going to be a cash flowing asset. And over time, uh, I just feel like sometimes you do the right thing and it's not like, could I have probably evicted them and got them out? Yeah. But you know, they've been there for 15 years and you know, if I just move up their rent a little bit at a time and, and make it nice for them, I think, I, ha I can do that and the property still pencils out and that's fine with me. Uh, and then once I get the other two units rented in the, in the property, but the same thing is, you know, how did I find the deal? I, I had built a relationship with the listing agent. Um, and I was, <clears throat> I was telling Sean that the one other strategy I really like, which I'm going to um, use property radar for is to find uh, absentee owners that own a portfolio and mm -hmm. I'm going to become their BFF and say, and have them seller finance the deal to me. Yep. I was going to say, one of my favorite things in property radar is there's, Sean is so smart. There's over 250 criteria within property radar. So depending on your strategy, I can throw different things at you, but 
uh, he separates, you're able to search by a few interesting things when it comes to absentee. It's not just absentee. You can search by the number of properties they own. So to your point, if you want to find somebody who owns a portfolio and of a certain size, like, hey, I only want to talk to somebody with over 10, 10 deals in a market or in a state. Um, you can also search by absentee owners that live out of state. So uh, it always makes me laugh, like uh, investors who own in California who live out of state they don't know what's going on. And it, it, it's crazy. Uh, and then you can search by things like when they bought it. So maybe they've owned for 27 years and probably taken all the depreciation. Okay, market to those that have meet that criteria. And because Property Radar has ages and demographics, you can look for aging landlords based on their age and how long. So how you stack the data, you can get really granular on who you focus. And another thing that you said that brought up something my dad taught me is walking that comp. If you bought one in a property, all you have to do is show proof that you've done it with other people to those landlords or to those agents. Hey, I just brought this property. I'm looking to buy more for something similar. Do you have any? Um, all you need is proof that somebody else said yes, right? And just leverage yeah. the heck out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And and like this fourplex of buying, the, um, the listing brokers already said he's got other properties he was going to sell. He's not ready yet. So it's like, if I make this process, do what I say, I close on the deal. I don't beat him up too much on inspections and so forth. Mm -hmm. He's going to give me the first opportunity on his next portfolio. They'll never hit the market. And it's a smaller town. They're not going to get a million offers anyways. But the fact is, is that it, it, it really, uh, we had talked about this the other day, messaging, how you, you talk to these people, right? Like it's a, it's a different conversation picking up the phone, using your, the tools of property radar, where I can pick up the phone and, and get the seller's information. Hi, my name is Bo. Um, you know, I just bought a property uh, close to your duplex and, and I see that you own a couple duplexes in the area. I'm interested in purchasing them. You know, I could, you know, I don't know if you're thinking about selling, you know, just open up the conversation and then does he want all cash or pay it? You know, because uh, a lot of their focus because they, they're, they've been landlords for 30 years, they've had the same tenants they're not they don't necessarily want to squeeze top dollar i mean obviously they want to get a fair price but they really want their tenant a lot of them not all of them want their tenants to be taken care of so like yeah i think it's not yeah. funny yeah. yeah people think landlords are sharks sometimes and i'm that landlord like that's why i've, I've started using property management because it's not it's not good I, I need to be raising rents but i i want tenants who are going to stay that i like that are low drama who don't bother me <laughs> So, yeah, by the time they're, you know, an aging landlord at 65, they probably have the perfect set of tenants that don't bother them, who don't call. They may have been there for 10 years and they care. And so, yeah, I agree with you. So it, their motivation for selling and, and then also they're really used to the cash flow. They're just maybe tired of the three T's, tenants, toilets, and trash. So being able to approach them is very different than approaching somebody who's only had rentals like you and me for, you know, maybe under a decade. It's so it, uh, that's why I love property radar, being able to use the data to bifurcate messaging and not just text or what you say, but also visuals. You know, you can you can do a lot with visuals that clue people in faster based on who you're trying to market to. It's pretty fun. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Hi, this is Bo Eckstein, host of the Investor Financing Podcast. I appreciate you checking out our channel. On this podcast, we talk about real estate, investing, financing, business lending, and acquiring and expanding your business. I'm sure you will find some videos here that will help you build your business empire. There's a lot to see. Take your time and make sure you comment, like, and subscribe. Thanks again. And I'm actually, uh, I love doing like YouTube, obviously, and things like that. But now I'm thinking like, um, I like the, the vidyards of the world, the bomb bombs, like, um, like now I don't want to type to people like, so I just, use, I've been using vidyard, which is like bomb bomb, but you can, you have a, a Chrome extension. It's like, shoot the quick video. If maybe if they're, I'm doing facilitating a loan for them and it's like, they have questions. It's like, okay, I'm not going to type this up quick, two seconds, boom, boom, boom. But I'm actually thinking about, you know, sending video messages or mm. video text to, uh, these people, these sellers and just, Hey, my name's Bo. Uh, so you own a couple of properties. I'm buying properties in the area. I just bought a property on Smith street. Would you be interested in selling any of your uh, rental units? It's simple. Hey, that is a much stronger than what I get. Oh my gosh. I get such annoying, just 
I, it's really bad. Some people have really bad data. My favorite was I sold a rental several years ago and I was getting marketing two years later. And funny enough, the house had sold a second time. So they have data that was two years old, whatever system they were using about, oh man, the amount of money that you're wasting is insane. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's crazy. As we wrap this up, because I know you got a busy morning ahead of you. Um, what I'd like to do maybe in a future episode is do a screen share, uh, walk through like, mm. and we could actually, we could, we could see, um, how you segment your list and, and you, you layer the different, um, yes, criteria. I, I would love that. I would love yeah, to do that for yeah, you. Because, um, you know, I, I haven't been using tools like, and, and, uh, I, back in the day I used, it was foreclosure radar at the time. And, mm. and oh. like, it changed so much. Yeah. I, I, I hear you. I did the same thing. I actually embarrassingly did not know that Property Radar had over a billion numbers and emails of owners baked in until I joined two years ago because how I was using it was very specific and I was getting leads delivered to my inbox every day. So I wasn't even logging in. Uh, Sean has continued to add data. He just added HOA liens. So a good example of that is that an owner is more likely to keep their mortgage current, but let their HOA go delinquent. Uh, which is funny to me, but it's an early sign of delinquency that people don't think about. So anyway. Yeah, no, it's amazing. I mean, I don't think there is another data provider in this space that has as much data as, as, as you guys do. Uh, I've been listening to Sean speak at conferences for geez, for since 2000, like four or five. I mean, he's like been around, you know, there's, there's all these other, you know, pop-up companies and everybody has these slick ways of doing things. But at the end of the day, I think really what it takes is, you know, you got to take one, one foot, one step in front of the other. And, and in the past, I really didn't get focused on like my messaging, right? Like you got to think about what you're doing. You can't just like throw poop against the wall, right? You got to yeah. like get a game plan, figure it out. And then you can also bring in virtual assistants to help you eventually, but like start yourself, like, okay, get clear with what you want to go after. Like I'm hyper-focused. I know the state I want to go in. I know I want to duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. Um, and I know like, you know, what markets or what sub markets to go after. So you can start niching down. Then I want somebody that obviously it's not owner occupied and it's probably been owned for like 10 plus years at least. And then you start breaking it down. Then the question is, is how am I going to approach this? Is it a direct oh. mail piece? Is it a text? Is it a phone call? Um, and I can't door knock yet because it's out of state. So what's the best way to door knock is probably a phone call then. You can virtual door knock too. There's a, yeah, I would love to do that for you. Um, I don't think people also know how to use the insights tools. I mean, some of those things that Sean has built into the app are insane to where if you're investing out of state and don't know it, you could spy on local flippers to find out what they're doing, find out what their buy box is on average, you know, the square footage, the age, things like that, to where you can intelligently make a decision like, hey, this is a really crowded space. There's probably a reason they're in this. You can find out um, if I buyers in the market, what their buy box is, so you can avoid it, try to compete. It's just, it's really powerful. So if you send me the the list that you like to tackle, uh, I will build it and we will have a half hour of, of nerdy fun. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> well, well, Aaron, this has been a great episode. I told you 20 minutes. Of course, it's 45 minutes. You can never uh, do anything in 20 minutes, but <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Appreciate your time. Love to have you back. I mean, we, we didn't even scratch the surface of all the stuff I can extract from your head. And um and the knowledge we can provide for people listening. And, and I'll put links below for Property Radar if you guys want to check it out. I think they give you a couple of days free. You can get yeah. the tires. and Three if, free days. And yeah. I'm writing on our blog to where if you've never experienced list stacking, if you read some of my examples, one of my favorite features of Property Radar is you can click a link and things are pre-stacked for you. It's the coolest thing. So if you don't have any experience, you can see it sort of in action that way. It's pretty fun. Awesome. Well, everyone, thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe so more YouTubers can find this uh, show and, and share it with your colleagues and I'll keep on going and we'll see you soon, guys. Bye.